Good afternoon. My name is Vitaly Milke. Today I represent two universities, Bauman Moscow State Technical University in its Center of Competence for AI, and Anglia Ruskin University from Cambridge, the UK, where I teach machine learning as well as advanced and applied math. In this presentation, I would like to focus on existing technology that we can use to experiment to create artificial general intelligence or strong AI or full AI. We'll also talk about the existing resources that we can use for machine learning and the restrictions that we need to address. And at the end, we'll come up with the first draft of the roadmap to move towards uh, AGI. Currently, there are a lot of concepts and theories around AGI, but in order to start moving to a practical implementation of AGI, we need to rely on existing machine learning tools and uh, frameworks, and this will help us to resolve a very important task. We can create a marriage of practitioners in applied AI, machine learning scientists, with AGI scientists. Currently, there are two camps and there is a lot of division between them, no alignment between them. Let's look at the standard model of the mind. There are three areas. Below is the so-called sensory intellect, where you get information, it's processed, and the subject, the subject um, referring to AGI, it interacts with nature, with the environment, all the motoric movements, and there are a lot of advancements that we've had in the past four years, or even five years, in applied AI, recognition, synthesis of voice, speech, even tactile feelings, and the second one is the environment. And it depends on the ultimate task. What kind of subject do we want to get at the end? And again, it doesn't need to be a universal subject that wants to uh, understand everything. And the third part, the long-term memory, the mega-calculator and the working memory, that's the entire brain, that's the biggest issue we're having. And the most practical use is to find a simple architecture, and many scientists are working on it, an architecture that can copy existing solutions, or like a simple brick, it could be the so-called cortical column or higher, so this could be the building block and it could have the best from the grey goo theory, it could be able to replicate and this is the simplest way to create this central core part of AGI. That's something that we are missing right now. But there is an issue. The algorithm behind the neural networks that are used everywhere, this backpropagation algorithm, do we actually have it in our mind? Let's look at the graph. We feed the data, then we look at the weights, then we get an answer, then we calculate the margin of error, and we incorporate it into the algorithm once again, and we retrain it, and we do it multiple times. As a result, we get a dependence on the number of the cells and you can see it on the graph, and it's an exponential dependence, depending on the amount of the neural networks. And uh, regardless of the size of the supercomputer, we would still hit a wall. And again, a brain contains 80 billion neural cells. If we come up with such a neural network, we won't be able to train it using backpropagation, even if we can imagine that we can create it. 
And in order to create super big neural networks, scientists have now hit a wall in terms of energy efficiency. Training a neural network in, comparable with the size of a mind of a person, that's 20 watt, would require several power stations. So we either have to wait for a breakthrough in hardware, like a quantum computer, or start experimenting with other algorithms that do not work like backpropagation. So what kind of options do we have? Backpropagation doesn't look like a biological system because we need to move along the entire neural network at least once. So we can divide big neural networks into bricks. And this is fully in line with the concept of creating AGI through small bricks, through cortical columns. So we would be able to avoid the combinatorial explosion of calculations because of the cursive dimensionality. So the second option is EPROP. I'd like to come up with the metaphor of a volleyball player. So, for example, he's doing a serve, he's serving the ball, and he's copying the actions of his coach. So you can reward this player either for a good serve, or you can reward that person based on each action. And at every stage, you can reward that person. The right uh, position, the right position of the hands when the ball is up. So the brain obviously has certain loops and we can try to copy it. And in this case, we can achieve the result in uh, one or two tries or in a single shot, as they say. And this is why we would need to a lower amount of hardware. There are other options. We don't have too much time. This is why I just you give you some references. Unfortunately, a slow learning curve of machines using back propagation is not the only issue. There are other limitations. Limited human resources, limited computing resources, limited development time and funding limits. Let's break it down. The number of coders and data scientists is limited. We cannot multiply them at the necessary rate. This is why we need to come up with solutions with a minimum human interaction during the learning process. We need some kind of self-learning algorithms. So we're all aware about reinforcement learning, but we also need to rely on curiosity. People have dopamine, and uh, that's the biggest reward. And we can program it in reinforcement learning, but curiosity is a more difficult thing. It's a challenge. If you look at the robot today, what do they do? We feed them a lot of data, databases, and they try to find patterns in those databases. If they don't find a pattern, they just return a mistake. And there's a European project on the goal-based open-ended autonomous learning robot. It's like a child that's learning by curiosity. Uh, Friedrich Engels once said that it was labor that made humans from monkeys into the humans we know them today. But it's actually, we believe it was curiosity. Curiosity is the motivation behind learning. So we can incorporate curiosity into that learning process and we can minimize interaction from humans into the learning process. Robots need to interact with nature, with the environment and set new goals. In what way? If a neural network identifies an unknown pattern, it doesn't return a mistake, but it tries to study it. And in this way, it retrains or fine-tunes this neural network. And it's a very important area, and we will keep it as part of the roadmap. And the second one is the self-coder. 
It's not fantastic, there are a lot of literature on that, and one of the areas is inductive program synthesis. Here's one of the papers. You can use recurrent algorithms to uh, code websites. This is called DeepCoder. Uh, there are simple examples and you can actually build on that. There are other options now to fine-tune this process. The most advanced one is when you have a big neural network, like uh, modern transformers, you feed a lot of data into it from GitHub, like uh, these are databases of uh, codes, and the neural network would generate a code like it generates a text and natural language. Take the paper to the left. Accuracy of learning is up to 90%. That's a fantastic result. To the right, the authors also use an important uh, approach. They use natural language to formulate an assignment, and then the neural network does the code based on it. GP3 works in a similar way. The outcomes are average, but you can fine-tune them and improve them, and you have open code. The next restriction is hardware and access to supercomputers. But at the stage of prototyping, you can use academic access to um, Google, Amazon, Intel, Microsoft Azure and others. IT giants are interested in setting up a community around their platforms. This is why they provide uh, free access or almost free to uh, scientists, professors, students, and you can leverage that. But if you have industrial scale experiments, once the study is over, you would need extra funding. The good news is that the rent price is going down, and it's going down pretty fast. Anything else? Well, you can actually come up with uh, collaborations with large companies. Why? What's the interest for the big companies? You can identify an issue which would lie exactly on the roadmap. In September 2019, before COVID-19 broke out, we had a conference on artificial and biological knowledge. Cambridge stage it together with DeepMind and its founder, Demis Hassabis, talked about this issue, how to transfer all of the achievements, particularly based on reinforcement learning, from the virtual space into the real-life world. It's easy to teach a robot to walk in virtual space. The robot falls, then it stands up, and it's almost immediate. But you cannot do real-life examples in the real environment. It would take years, and you would destroy the, the environment because the robot would break everything. So transfer of these trained subjects into real life space is an issue and that's what we're working on. What are the options here? First, you need to bring the model of the virtual reality as close to reality as possible. Take Google Maps. You have the street views, you have pictures, and you need to add a lot of the physics, uh, gravity and elastic interaction. Second, to modify the subject itself based on the laws of friction, for example. If it's a robot, you need to add friction in joints, uh, air resistance, and so on. So the subject itself needs to be as close as possible to what we actually really have in the real environment. So you train that subject uh, in the virtual space, and then you just fine-tune it in the real space, and it will be cheap. Now, the third limitation is time. Definitely, you would like to do everything yourself, but you don't have too much time. So, what are the options to accelerate it? You need to rely on existing frameworks as much as possible in your effort to come up with AGI. And you also need to use unsupervised learning as much as possible. Why? 
There is the so-called concept of end-to-end -end learning. Previously, scientists try to break down a big task into several neural networks to run everything in parallel to speed it up. So you break down the task into several ones, you have several databases and there would be mistakes accumulated in those databases also due to human error. And so the entire quality at the end was poor. Right now, our processes are faster and they're more accessible and we can actually make these neural networks bigger. We can feed raw data into them in order to get a finished reply, a finished response. And in this way, we save time because we know that up to 80% of the time and cost of AI project is spent on data mining, cleaning and organizing data, and reformatting and feeding into the neural network work. And surprisingly, the more data you have, the better this end-to-end -end approach works. GPT-3 is the best example. Despite the huge success, it's still a Chinese room. You don't understand what's happening inside. And the success is driven by the sheer number of uh, the training uh, data sets. You have uh, 175 billion parameters, 570 gigabyte of text, so size matters. But at the end, the uh, neural network will work not just with sentences at chatbot, but with paragraph. That there is still a limitation that the authors indicated. It uh, has issues with coherence, with common sense. Like, here's a question. If I place a cheese into a fridge, will it melt? The neural network won't be able to give you an answer. And again, if the source text has a lot of questions, uh, it cannot prioritize. Our brain can do it. But if you take a most advanced chatbot like GPT-3, it starts looking for uh, patterns uh, in the databases for an answer. But if it doesn't find an answer, it would just make a joke. But here's my question. Do people, real humans, behave in a different way? No. We are using our own brain, our own memory to find an answer to a question from an interlocutor. If you don't have an answer, then you would just make a joke or keep silent, the situation permits. Well, GPT-3 has uh, just an issue with physics. Uh, it just missed physics classes in school. But the good news is that you can retrain it, you can fine-tune it. And Given our experience, we know that bigger neural networks are much more efficient than smaller ones. Even in two or three tries, you can get a very good result. So from, if you go from 13 billion parameters to 175 billion, it can actually allow you to increase the quality by two times from 30% to 60%. But if, if we increase the number of parameters by several times more, then we can make it even bigger. We can make it even better. When are we going to have consciousness uh, in machines? Uh, that's a question that's often asked. We can actually put off this question until we can come up with uh, a uh, um, neural network of uh, 80 billion and we can train it like a brain. GPT-3 only has 93% of text in English and 7% in German and Romanian. The next step for GPT-3 would be a multilingual training. Why is it important for AGI? In 2017, we had a joint experiment of Google Brain and Google Translate, and it's described in this paper. They trained a model for 12 language pairs, and after that, the neural network was able to translate from one language to another, uh, which it wasn't trained, uh, I mean, it didn't have those pairs. For example, it got trained into Japanese and English and into Korean English, and after that, it was able to translate from Japanese into Korean. 
because, you know, we have to come up with a space of minions. Take the word snow, African nations won't have it. Or if you take like, the Russian spleen, you can do it, but it would take you a paragraph to describe it. But if you come up with a space of meanings, you will be able to do it. If you use big, super big transformer networks, then we can come up with knowledge graphs and these so-called seeds of intellect using existing technology. And I'm sure that very soon a pre-trained model of GPT-3 would emerge and we will see the weights or some similar model from Intel, for example. What's the next idea would look like? As I said first, it's a multi-translator using the fine-tuning technology. And the second option focuses on the fundamental question, why do we need AGI? Perhaps to rule the world? Well, actually, it has to help humanity to advance uh, progress in science and then progress in the economy. This is why we need to come up with an interim goal. It's uh, the AI engineer, AI scientist. How do we do it? We need to retrain the transformer model based on science papers using the fine-tuning technology. And it's a real task, and that would be incorporated into our roadmap. We would need bigger databases or knowledge graphs and DivBart in particular has implemented this idea. They crawl the internet and come up with knowledge graphs. There are just 20 categories of websites but they cover 98% of the public web in 50 languages. So we're now ready to come up with the first draft of the roadmap towards AGI. Number one, blue one, is the building block. It has to replicate the code so that the code could be made by the machine. It has to be rewritten by the machine. Then reinforcement learning, but it also has to be curiosity driven. It's marked in yellow and it's all then wrapped into the end-to-end -end learning framework where we feed a lot of data. And these neural networks and their architecture has to rely on several algorithms which do not equal to backpropagation, at least not along the entire learning process, to minimize demand for hardware. And again, I'm talking about the left part. And it has to be a virtual environment that would be as close to the real world as possible. Then we have this pre-trained subject, the most advanced chatbot that could do everything, and then we transfer, transfer it into the real world, create a robot, and then use the fine-tuning technology to retrain it. As I said, this will be cheap and fast. And you can actually do it based on existing frameworks or the pre-trained neural networks that we currently have in open domain or that we will get very soon. That's it. You have the references. Thank you so much for your attention.